Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for inviting me to the conference. Um, and just before I start, wanted to confirm if you can hear me okay and if you can see the presentation. Absolutely perfect on all counts. Thank you. <laughs> Great. So I'm Vittoria Franchini. Uh, I'm a manager at Kumi Consulting. Uh, Kumi Consulting is a uh, sustainability consultancy uh, that is specialized in responsible sourcing. Uh, so we focus on uh, advising companies in particular on responsible sourcing strategies. Uh, we work across uh, three different sectors, minerals, uh, of course, um, also agriculture and uh, fashion supply chains as well. Um, so today I wanted to discuss um, the OECD guidance and the implications that the OECD guidance has for large-scale mining companies. Um, my presentation will focus a lot on uh, the work that we've been doing with companies and also drawing from practical experiences. Um, but of course, I understand that some of you uh, might not have heard of the OECD guidance, so I will set the context a bit for this conversation first. So what is OECD guidance? Uh, the OECD guidance is uh, the cornerstone framework for conducting due diligence in uh, supply chains of minerals. Uh, so the OECD guidance sets out uh, five steps that companies along the mineral supply chain from downstream companies, uh, consumer facing companies, all the way to mining companies uh, can reference and can use uh, to conduct due diligence in their supply chains. Uh, the OECD guidance was developed in 2011 uh, by the OECD, um, but it was developed uh, through a multi-stakeholder process, which involved uh, participants from governments, from the industry, including companies, uh, as well as civil society organizations. And the purpose was to design a practical framework uh, that different types of companies can adopt uh, to, uh, to implement due diligence. So despite having been around for almost a decade, uh, the OECD guidance uh, still uh, experiences some misconceptions, which uh, I wanted to briefly go through before we delve into the applications to uh, large-scale mining companies. Um, so first, um, the OECD guidance contains uh, two annexes. Uh, these refer to uh, tin, tantalum, tungsten on one side, and a second annex on gold. Uh, so these annexes uh, go into the details of how companies can conduct due diligence on these supply chains. But it's important to remember that the five-step framework that is set out uh, applies to any mineral in, um, uh, that is being sourced by, uh, by companies in mineral supply chains. Um, so it's not focused only on what are called the three TGs or conflict minerals, uh, but it can be applied to, for example, copper and cobalt. Um, it can be applied to uh, minerals such as uh, nickel and lithium uh, and, and others. And uh, what we've seen is an increasing trend, uh, both from a legal perspective and also in the market, uh, of the OECD guidance being adopted as the standard of reference across these different minerals. Uh, so a few examples are, um, as many of you know, for example, Dodd-Frank, uh, which has been adopted before the OECD guidance was in place, uh, but it does reference the OECD guidance. Uh, the EU, which has recently adopted its own conflict minerals rule, um, it focuses on 3TG. Uh, but more broadly, there are also market requirements that take into account different metals and minerals. And these include, for example, the recent uh, responsible sourcing requirements that were introduced by uh, the London Metal Exchange, which uh, is um, requiring explicit brands that trade on the exchange, uh, and specifically those that trade um, uh, co copper, cobalt, nickel, tin, lead, and zinc to apply the OECD guidance to conduct due diligence. Uh, the second misconception is that it applies only to uh, artisanal small-scale mining operations um, and that large-scale mining companies are lower risk, therefore they don't need to worry about the requirements of the OECD guidance. But of course, um, the OECD guidance, if you read it closely, it does contain specific requirements for large-scale mining companies. Um, therefore, as actors in the supply chain, they are required to demonstrate to their stakeholders that they're conducting due diligence on their supply chain as well. Uh, it does 
uh, put emphasis on artisanal and small scale mining in the sense that encourages integration of artisanal small scale mining in the supply chain rather than uh, calling for the exclusion of these actors uh, from the market. Uh, the last uh, misconception is that it focuses on um, areas of high risk and conflict that are only in uh, Central Africa, uh, including the DRC and adjacent countries. Uh, I'm thinking also of uh, the reference of Dodd-Frank to these areas, which is the scope of the legislation, but the OECD guidance takes it to uh, a broader uh, level. So it is global in scope and it applies to what are called all conflict affected and high risk areas or so-called CARAs. So the reason why this last point is important in particular um, is because uh, CARAs really are uh, the trigger for due diligence. So companies that source from conflict affected and high risk areas uh, should conduct uh, enhanced due diligence on their high risk supply chains. Um, so you'll see from the map immediately that uh, there are various countries that are red uh, that can be considered uh, CARAs. This is not an exhaustive list, but it's just a representative of what a CARA could be. Uh, and of course, it doesn't include only the DRC and adjacent countries, but includes countries all around the world. Uh, so the point here is to highlight that uh, CARAs uh, can be anywhere uh, and are defined by four uh, main factors. And those are the presence of conflict, uh, the presence of human rights abuses, including, for example, child labor, forced labor, uh, torture or genocide, uh, the presence of weak governance, uh, issues also related to uh, corruption, bribery, and anti-money laundering, uh, and also challenges related to mineral flows. Uh, and by that, I mean challenges related to, for example, the smuggling of uh, minerals or illegal uh, minerals uh, being sourced and making their way into supply chains uh, all around the world. Um, I won't go into the details of specific countries, um, but you'll see here that there are various minerals mentioned. So for example, um, lithium, uh, cobalt, uh, nickel, graphite, which uh, are not uh, so-called conflict minerals, but are sourced from CARAs. Therefore, companies that are located in uh, CARAs and produce these minerals, or companies that source these minerals, uh, are required under the OECD guidance uh, requirements to uh, demonstrate that they've conducted due diligence. Um, so in particular, if we think about uh, that last point and what the responsibilities are, uh, for companies that source from these countries, when they conduct due diligence, it means making sure that the suppliers that they buy minerals from uh, are managing risks effectively and are obviously conducting due diligence on their own supply chains. So companies that are located in uh, these areas need to take steps to demonstrate to their customers, uh, but also other stakeholders, for example, investors that might uh, refer to the OECD guidance requirements, uh, that they are conducting uh, due diligence and implementing uh, the adequate uh, procedures to do so. So speaking a little bit more practically, what does this mean for large scale producers and getting to actually the gist of the presentation? Um, so for large scale producers, if we think about what defines a CARA, uh, the steps that uh, producers can take involve establishing strong policies and procedures um, or their internal management systems should be strong. So having uh, well-defined steps internally that are clearly communicated to help manage uh, risks, particularly in relation to corruption, bribery, and money laundering. Uh, so what does this mean? It's uh, particularly related to, for example, the adoption of a code of conduct, or um, it's about training employees on that code of conduct. Uh, it's also about uh, making sure that records about payments are maintained and making sure that those payments can be uh, showed or shared uh, to the extent possible with stakeholders who ask for them and also ask for uh, evidence of that due diligence that we talked about. Um, and this is particularly true for companies that even if they believe that uh, their operations are clean and they might well be, um, it's important to be able to demonstrate that to, to their stakeholders. The second step um, companies can take is uh, obviously taking measures to manage uh, conflict risks. 
Uh, and conflict risks are not only those related to uh, interstate wars or large scale uh, combats, of course, but it also relates to local conflicts and the potential of that conflict actually taking place. Um, so this is a picture that uh, we took while traveling in the DRC just before landing in the Copper Belt. Um, and you'll see uh, that there is a large uh, pit uh, there in the center of the picture, and that is uh, the operations of a large scale mining company. Uh, right next to uh, the pit, uh, there are local communities uh, on one side, and on the other you'll see uh, artisanal small scale mining uh, operations. Uh, so the point here is, you know, large-scale uh, companies don't operate in a silo. They operate in areas where often uh, they uh, deal with local communities, uh, their nearby communities, especially in areas like the DRC. They're uh, involved in mining activities. If not with a company, then they might be involved in artisanal small-scale uh, operations. So it's important for companies that operate in these environments to ensure that they don't contribute to conflict. And that doesn't mean uh, necessarily starting a conflict, but also making sure that, for example, the security providers that they hire are adequately trained, uh, that they're armed only when permitted. Uh, so you'll see the other part of the picture is uh, an individual who is armed uh, with a gun, uh, and that is an illegal um, an illegal arm or legal act uh, in this case. Uh, so what's important is for companies to make sure that that doesn't happen. Uh, and in particular, apply the voluntary principles for security and human rights, which are clear, clearly referenced in the OECD guidance. Lastly, um, if large scale mining companies also source from third party suppliers, they should ensure that every step they're taking to manage risks in their supply chain uh, are also taken by their own suppliers. And first of all, it's important to uh, identify those suppliers. Sometimes companies don't even know where the third party minerals come from. They might buy from the open market. Uh, therefore, it's important to map their supply chain and identify who those actors are. Uh, and once that has been done, uh, make sure that the risks, uh, possible risks that are associated with those operations are managed. In the case of artisanal mining, which I mentioned earlier, um, there might be particular risks for that context. So we know that, for example, uh, child labor is common in artisanal uh, mining operations that are illegal or illicit. Uh, therefore, it's important to take those risks into account. Um, here, I hope you can see it. It's um, short video that we took while uh, doing a site assessment. So where we were standing is uh, the site of a third party supplier to a large scale mining company. And while we were conducting the assessment on that third party supplier, we noticed that just across that small river, uh, there were illegal artisanal miners. And those uh, individuals circled uh, in white are two children uh, around, we estimated the age of eight to 10 years old. Uh, that we're working uh, to dig uh, cobalt. So it's not that uncommon to see it. Uh, if it was easy enough for us to go on the ground and observe uh, and observe that, it's uh, possible for anyone to, to do so, especially if you think about media or civil society organizations uh, that might be investigating these issues. Uh, but on the other side, if you are a large scale mining company, you can make sure that you visit these sites and make sure that any associated risks are adequately managed. So I'll stop there um, and leave time for questions. Um, and here's my email if you would like to discuss any of the above further. Thank you. Brilliant, Ab absolutely fantastic, Victoria. And thank you so much as well for the brilliant footage of those artisanal miners um, in the DRC. So yes, you can imagine that fantastic applause that is coming to you now from around the world. Um, and we've got time for, I think, one quick question on this. Um, and actually I'm gonna draw it from the, the YouTube um, uh, chatter that is going on at the moment. Um, and what this, this is doing actually, I wonder if um, you could, uh, share with us any of your thoughts, Victoria, on how can we learn from our understanding with regards to, say, artisanal mining and the social interaction 
um, and perhaps the, the conflict even that happens within communities in places like the DRC, um, and then bring it to a European context. Is there anything that we can learn between those two contexts just with regards to um, interacting with um, different stakeholders who are all working around um, a single potential asset? Sure, sure. Um, so uh, what, one of the big projects that we've worked on is uh, the project on, um, it's called Mutashi, it's located in the DRC, and it's one of the biggest uh, projects uh, involving artisanal miners uh, that dig uh, for cobalt. And we've been doing this work with Trafigura. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it's a artisanal small scale site, but it's actually large in scale. So there are thousands of miners on, on the site. And uh, what's important uh, to remember in these contexts is that obviously companies should uh, take into account the local context, so take into account the local challenges. And the case in the DRC, as in many other countries uh, where there is artisanal mining, it's important to uh, not forget that these miners, if they're removed from a site or excluded from the supply chain, they will move somewhere else uh, because they're looking for livelihoods. They depend on those activities. Um, in terms of uh, standards or lessons learned that we can apply and trying to you know, bridge together different uh, areas. Uh, what we've done is at that site, um, well, the, the project managers on site have worked with uh, the government. Uh, they've worked with um, a mining cooperative, uh, which has supported the formalization of artisanal miners. And on our end, uh, we've supported the implementation and monitoring of the implementation of, um, of standards for health and safety. So it's about taking, for example, international good practice standards for health and safety um, and applying them to the local context. So if you think about the activities of artisanal miners, how can we make sure that uh, there aren't any fatalities on site? How do we make sure that they dig to a depth that is adequate to, uh, to, um, to, to protect their lives and also their, uh, uh, their health? Um, what, what can be done to, to, to manage those risks? Um, and obviously engagement is, is uh, one of the key steps, ongoing engagement and consultation to obviously observe the views of, of local stakeholders should not be uh, forgotten. So it's not about imposing anything, but actually working together um, to make sure that you respond to the needs of, of the local stakeholders. Brilliant. Thank you, Victoria. Uh, one final question on this. I, I think I could keep asking you questions, but I'm acutely aware of time. Um, so this is something where we, we've had a number of, of talks um, over the course of this week um, that have mentioned um, artisanal and small scale mining. Um, and tomorrow morning, we've actually got Estelle um, from Levin Sources coming in to again touch on that matter. And I'm sure you know Estelle well. Um, and this is something here where I think often people think that artisanal miners are, um, are always um, just somebody who is a local farmer that sees the opportunity and leaps over the fence and starts go, going to scrape cobalt out the ground. And in fact, um, especially with regards to the Colwazi area, for example, where a lot of this footage comes from, that's not the case, is it? It's a case where actually these miners are very much professional miners. And in some cases, even their approach towards health and safety um, puts the large scale mine, miners to shame. Would you agree with that? Or have you got any comments to that? Um, well, the, I, I wouldn't talk about putting to shame in, in our case, but what has uh, really been valuable is seeing how uh, the measures that we've implemented or helped implement uh, on site has, uh, has actually improved the productivity of many miners. Um, and consulting with them, uh, we've always got positive feedback about the ability to, to manage risks that otherwise they wouldn't be able to manage. And yes, maybe it is challenging to, for a miner to uh, think, okay, I have to put on my PPE and my helmet every day, but it, it's, it, becomes, it becomes daily practice. So it's not, it's not um, something that, uh, that prevents them from doing their job, it actually uh, helps them do their job better and, and save their lives. And this is something that um, yeah, we've, we've received definitely positive feedback from even from directly the miners that we spoke to on the ground. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for joining us here this afternoon, Vittoria. Brilliant. So another round of applause to say thank you to Vittoria, everybody.